Welcome to a brand new episode of Insomnia for Lunch. And today we are talking about our favorite animated action films. I just want to start out by asking you, what is a, the criteria that you went with? Like, what was the selection process for the films that you selected? I'm pretty sure I've said this before, but I'm not a big animation person. So my pool of selection was already extremely limited. So it kind of like came down to the simple fact of like, what animated movies do I like to actually have action in it? So to start there, but then to like even condense it more, it's just like, well, what actually has like good, like cinematic quality action that can compete with live action films? And yeah, like when you look at the action in these movies and the overall quality of these movies, they definitely like deserve that theatrical experience. Even the one that's went straight to home video should have got a theatrical release, but nevertheless, they're definitely the best of their respective categories. Uh, mine process is a little more simple. I think I went with films that had to do with like dystopian futurism. And um, I guess so you could say ironically, all of them have like scores that kind of like are hypnotic. They kind of put you in the world that the film is creating. And it's just like this continuous soundscape um, within the film but with that being said let's get into your first film all right so i'm gonna go ahead and just go in order of, like how these movies are released like by year by year so my first choice is from 2004 and it's definitely like a movie that for sure put the director brad bird on the map and one of my personal favorite not just animated movies but pixar movies and it's just like I just, like some uh, superhero movies, like whatever you want to call it. I'm talking about The Incredibles. People love this movie so much, especially when you look at with the movies we would get, the Fantastic Four movies we would get right after in 2005 and what, 2007, whatever. People like I've, I remember people saying back then, 2004, 20 years ago, that this is the Fantastic Four movie we always should have gotten. <laughs> One of the favorite things that I think that I did is kind of address the whole when the villain has the upper hand on the hero and then starts monologuing. You know, I'm glad like they like openly called that out. It was just, <laughs> it was a being to the undoing of certain like characters in the movie, like, you know, situations or whatever. And it kind of set the ground for like, in, uh, to a certain extent, what we would ultimately see, at least in that first Avengers movie, like that final fight at the end where they're all together and they're fighting the uh, Omnidroid, as they call it. You know, like that fight in the city, like that Metropolis type said, like that's kind of set the standard for what we would eventually see. And like, say, you know, that big fight at the Battle of New York and Avengers, even Man of Steel is just like, you know, it kind of like, you know, I feel like it's kind of influential in its own way in terms of just like um, its contribution to the modern era of, you know, superhero film culture. And yeah, like it definitely started a promising career for the director, Brad Bird. Um, he would go on to direct, like, you know, of course, I have to find my way to throw it in, like Mission Impossible. He directed that Mission Impossible movie. And I feel like this definitely opened that door for him. And I'm not the biggest fan of the second one. To be honest, I don't really think it's that memorable. But with this first one, like I said, you know, like especially when Mr. Incredible is battling the Omni Joint by himself, that was a good fight. And then just the action overall, like, you know, under those flight things that those guys on the island have, you know, the action with that. And, you know, each character gets their own, like, signature action spot. And like even like, you know, that sneaky like stealth scene with Mrs. Incredible where she's like sneaking around the facility trying to like rescue her husband, whatever. That was dope. But yeah, that final fight, that final fight was epic. You know, when Samuel Jackson's Frozone comes in and, you know, it was like it was dope. Like this is definitely like a standard bearer for like animated action on the American side, like and on like a cinematic level. I know there is a third one coming out. I kind of am curious to see how the third one turns out. But at the same time, just like. I, from what I understand, Brad Bird is coming back to direct as well. Um, maybe it'll work. Like, maybe it'll be just be another forgettable movie. I don't know. But, like, no matter what happens, whatever, however I feel about the second one, however the third one turns out, the first one is still a classic and is, in my opinion, the best Pixar movie aside from the Toy Story films. So that's an interesting statement. I mean, Pixar is it's, it's etched out its own place in history. So I, I think that would be an interesting debate. Um, for anyone in the comments who 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 is a lover or a, f a fanatic of Pixar, 
do you agree that besides the Toy Story franchise, The Incredibles is the second best Pixar films? But um, I will say, like, this topic, doing the research on this topic kind of allowed me to realize, like, that this subsection of 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 action doesn't really have as many films as you would think and 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 also it led me down the road to realize that the animated genre in itself doesn't have as many films as you probably think that it does and i think that that's a space that uh more films need to venture down and also it kind of put it on one of, on my bucket list to actually create an animated film uh, with that being said, I did pick a film that has ironically inspired um, some of our favorite live action films, whether it's The Matrix or Inception or Looper or even um, Michael Jackson's Scream video. Um, a lot of the, a lot of a lot of things have come. A lot of classics have come from the creation of this film. And the film that I am talking about was released in 1988, and it is called Akira, Akira, yeah. which is a Japanese film. Um, obviously, in order to fit into my list, it has to be a dystopian, futuristic story. If you've seen Chronicle, you've pretty much seen the gist of what this film is. But if you're a, a person who likes like anime and just a film that that gives you like that those like blood squibs and like headshots and it's really uncensored when it comes to like the way that they kill people and it's it's very extreme when you look at the component of like telekinesis or telepathy in this film it also influenced like tv shows like stranger things with the character of 11 and um even even um the cure um by kurosawa like that that film specifically i see the influence on that film when it comes to like the flashbacks or like even like these um images that are like imposed on a person's mind to make them believe something's happening when it's really not and like even the one scene um in akira where the guy's like trying to like put his insides back into his body but it's like his, it's nothing really happening to him in reality he just perceives it that way it's kind of like the same thing in the cure where the detective thinks that his wife is hanging from the ceiling and he's like reacting to it. And it's just like this great, like memorable scene because of the way that the sound is like omitted from it. And you just see this guy's like pure reaction. Like that scene in Akira reminds me of Akira. And um, it's just like everything that you can see from other movies that um, they take from Akira is like all like classic things that is classic in Akira, but then also classic in the way that they, that they pay homage to this to this film and so if you're a person who who loves just like fantasy but you also equally love seeing people get shot in the head which sounds crazy but i'm one of those people akira is definitely the movie for you it's it's again it's, it was released in 1988 but it's definitely something that that can stand the test of time and um, if you're interested in any of those movies, TV shows, or even music videos, and I forgot to even mention how many times Kanye West has referenced this film um, in his in his music videos. But um, if you like any of those things, then definitely check out Akira. Um, it's kind of hard to find, but if you have Crunchyroll, that's probably the best way to find it. Again, the film is Akira, 1988. And... Let me let's try to say the director's name. <laughs> I was gonna ask you. Uh, <laughs> Katsuhiro Otomo is how I pronounce it. Um, but yeah, obviously he's influenced animes like One Piece, Dragon Ball Z, and things of that nature. But um, yeah, it's just a classic film. One key oh, thing yeah. I'm surprised you haven't mentioned right now, and that's the infamous bike slide, the motorcycle slide. Back. That you've seen, <laughs> trust me, you've seen this motorcycle slide and so many something as recent as like nope, you know. Uh, at one point, uh, Kiki Palmer's character does it in nope, like you know, you've seen, you've seen it. Like I'm pretty sure Trinity does it in the Matrix. Like you know, you've seen this motorcycle slide before, and yeah, it Akira is the one that made that move, the move. Uh, one last thing I'll say about Akira is 
I don't know. At this point, like the live action adaptation has been in development hell for what feels like 20 years, 20 plus years. Like, I don't know if it's ever going to get off the ground. I know at one point Keanu Reeves was supposed to play the main protagonist. Stop. And yeah, I don't know what happened with that. But, Just stop. You know. Americans don't touch it. Obviously, <laughs> there's a reason why Steven Spielberg and and um, George Lucas said no in 1987. And um, I think we need to keep that an American tradition of keeping our hands off of this classic uh, piece of literature and now film. Just leave it alone, please. Oh, you know, if it was made back then by one of them, like Michael J. Fox would have been. Like, is the main character a character? Like, that's his name? No, the main character is, um, well, it's two main characters. It's uh, Tetsuo and um, uh, Kanida are the two okay, yeah. uh, main characters. And obviously with names that specific to their culture, just leave it alone, bro. Like there's no point to Americanize something like that. Just leave it alone. All right, my next choice is something that went straight to DVD slash Blu-ray back in 2013. It was during like the peak, the golden era of DC animation, you know, these straight to home video DC animated movies. You know, like adapting classic comics and, you know, like turning into these like, you know, 75 minute, 80 minute, um, you know, animated films. And this one, I'm talking about this one as collective because it was released individually in two parts. But I'm talking about collectively as one two and a half hour epic. That is the adaptation, the 2013 adaptation of Frank Miller's Batman The Dark Knight Returns. You know, one of the greatest graphic novels of all time. And it turned into one of the greatest DC animated movies of all time, if not the greatest, like, you know, up there, like, you know, some people probably say like Under the Red Hood, which is another great one. But, you know, this was up there. And yeah, it's just like the way they translated the action, like, you know, the panels, like, you know, to like, you know, to the screen, like it was it was incredible. You know, it was directed by uh, Jay Oliva, who went on to direct some other good DC animated films. And yeah, I just I have to say, I really miss this era. Like, I don't know what, there's just a point with these DC animated movies where I was just like, I'm not watching anymore. And for what I've heard, they haven't got any better, but let's just like stick to the, this special time when we were getting like hit after hit, banger after banger. And yeah, like, you know, just the, just in terms of casting, like, you know, having Peter, Peter Weller, having Peter Weller, the voice, you know, like the guy who played Robocop, you know, have him voice Batman. I mean, that was just such an epic choice, and he did a great job. Kevin Conroy will always be the GOAT when it comes to Batman's voice, but, you know, Peter Weller, he def he definitely did a good job. And, you know, like, you know, that fight that uh, Batman has, like, in that, like, mud hole, whatever, with the, the mutant leader, that's one of the most, like, badass, like, action scenes, like, in any animation period, you know, like, just, like, how they did that, like, you know, bro was getting down, and I forgot how the line goes, but it's like something along the line is this ain't a mud hole. This is an operating table and I'm the surgeon, like one of the most hardest lines from, from the comic, from the movie, from whatever. It's just like, that's just one of the hardest lines ever. And the final fight between Batman and Superman, it was great. Um, just like, it was definitely a faithful and respectful and just a, a genuine, like, great adaptation of one of the greatest, like I said, graphic novels ever written. Like, you know, I haven't read too many comics and graphic novels, but that's one that I did read. And I loved what uh, Jay Oliver did with that adaptation. So for my second pick, this film starts out with kind of being a competitor to Akira in terms of its legacy and just like how trendsetting it is. But I am going to let anyone who knows um, who who was interested in, in in watching this film? That it does not keep up with the action that Akira has. Um, and the my second pick is Ghost in the Shell. Right? I think this film came out in 1996, and the director um, I think I'm gonna be able to say his name better. Uh, Mamoru Oshi um, is the director of Ghost in the Shell, and um, the movie starts out like being very competitive to Akira and the thing that will make you sit up is just the way that that headshot 
Um, I think they're on the elevator when the headshot happens, and the way that his the, the head opens up and just implodes, it makes you lean forward. But as the movie goes on, you learn like, okay, it's it's a lot more talking. Like the the action is spaced out, but. Um, I think that at the time of the release, like if you were watching it at the time of the release, like it would have been like this fantasy story. But I think now if you watch it in 2024, it becomes like this horror story. It becomes a horror story just because it it kind of resembles our reality. And it's like I think the scariest thing, too, is like the line on the boat. Like this is the image that um, sticks in my head. It's just like how um, she's talking about like. Um, the thing that sets her apart is her ideas and her voice. But it's like, we know now that all, all of that can be mimicked with AI. So it's like, what really, um, like she said in the movie, what makes you human? Um, so for me, I mean, obviously you can see um, where, what the Matrix took from this film in terms of like the, the graphics, especially specifically in the beginning. Um, I don't think that this movie is as influential as Akira in terms of like people like taking uh, different parts from it. Um, in music terms, it hasn't been sampled as much, but I do feel like in terms of its philosophy, it kind of like has influenced a lot of things, in in, in including like our technology. And so um, what would you like, what's, what was your impression like from watching or your continued watches from Ghost in the Shell? I definitely looked at it more as like, cause you kind of already alluded to it as more of like, almost like a drama, like a sci-fi drama, because it is very dialogue heavy, you know? And especially if you go into it, like I did, having seen the live action 2017 adaptation first, that you're gonna like, it's gonna, it's definitely gonna be kind of jarring in the sense that you're like, oh, like, you know, it's not as action heavy as that live adaptation version was, but it's just like, that's something that I respected about. It's like it actually took time to like tell a story because especially from a time that this movie came out where you expect something that's animated to be either be really silly or just really be real like action heavy and not take itself seriously. But this is definitely a very self-serious movie. And not to say there's no humor in that at all, but it's definitely like, you know, something more akin to like the tone you would find in like a Christopher Nolan movie or something like that, you know, like and um and yeah, like I definitely saw like, you know, it's like cultural significance in terms of like its influence and, you know, like you said, like on the Matrix and things of that nature. And for me, like I always love like one of my favorite things about sci-fi is these kind of stories where you do have like an android or some kind of like, you know, well, let's just say like android or whatever. And the idea of like the whole narrative of what does it mean to be human and, you know, how this influenced like movies like Blade Runner and like even to this day, like when you watch something as recent as the creator, you know, it's just like it's it has like this type of movie, like this type of story has just an everlasting influence and it's a source of inspiration. And another thing I'll say is between this movie, like you know, Ghost in the Shell and Akira, like they definitely were influential, like in the Matrix, not just in terms of the live action movies, but also in terms of if you have if you guys haven't seen them, the Animatrix, which is like I think like nine short films combined together. You can watch them individually or sequentially. But like if you haven't seen the Animatrix, like especially if you're a Matrix fan and you haven't seen the Animatrix, you need to go watch those movies. Like there's some great stories and great um short films in those. And yeah, like you could tell when watching the Animatrix how much they took inspiration from this movie Ghost in the Show and also Akira. All right, so my final choice for in, in terms of uh, my favorite uh, animated action film is an anime, like, you know, your first two choices. And that is Dragon Ball Super Broly, released in 2018. Uh, I grew up with Dragon Ball Z. Like, I was a huge Dragon Ball Z fan as, like, a teenager. And I remember watching the original Broly movie and watching, like, a lot of those, like, straight-to-video uh, Dragon Ball Z movies. And... When it comes to the more recent ones, like, you know, like, um, was it Battle of the Gods, like, Frieza and all those ones? Like, I haven't been that much of a fan of them. Like, I don't know. There's just, like, those first two ones that they recently released, like, I wasn't too big on them. But this one, with uh, in 2018, with Dragon Ball Super Broly, I was like, they finally nailed it. Like, you know, um, the director, now nah, I'm going to try to say his name, uh, Tatsuya Nagamine. 
if I'm saying it wrong, sorry. But uh, this movie, like, I feel like compared to other Dragon Ball Z films and other, even like, even the actual Dragon Ball Z show, uh, I feel like even without having watched Dragon Ball Super, like the sequel series or whatever, like, even without having watched that, watching this movie, I feel like they actually cared more so than any other time about actual characterization. Uh, we get pretty much a, I don't know if you want to call it a reboot, but a retelling of, you know, Goku and Vegeta and Broly's like origin story. We see, you know, their parents on planet Vegeta, you know, we see Frieza come and, you know, wipe out the Saiyans or whatever. But the way the story is told this time, it's like, I actually cared, <laughs> you know, that, and I actually cared about Broly this time because as much as I did remember liking that original Broly movie, he's not a character in that movie. He's just a mindless brute. I'm not sure by this point, we all can admit that. Yes, he has a cool look. I get it. He's always had that cool, iconic look. And just being as badass, like a like a stoppable force, a movable object type of situation. And in terms of what I've seen from recent like incarnations of Dragon Ball Z, you know, Dragon Ball Super or whatever, like this is the best that I've seen action-wise. You know, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball franchise has always been has always been known for its action. And seeing the action here was just like epic on another level. Like I can I can only imagine how it was seeing a theater, like an IMAX or something like that. Like I wish I had I watched it at home, unfortunately. But even watching it at home, I was like, this is just epic. You know, and um just like, you know, the powers, the charged up, just the visuals, like um, it was funny kind of seeing like Broly like beat up Frieza, you know, Frieza basically had his strap while Goku and Vegeta learned the, the fusion dance. Well, once again, like, you know, kind of resetting the whole creation of the Gogeta character. They, you know, rebooted that. And even that, that fight between Gogeta and um, Broly was all the <laughs> wish for fun. Everything that you would want it to be and beyond, it was. Going in and out of different dimensions. And just, I just remember watching it. And it goes on for quite a long time. Like, it's a very extensive fight sequence. And I'm just like, man, I just remember just watching it. just like, oh, wow. Like, they they really did this. And so, to me, it's still the best in terms of, like, the recent incarnation of what we've seen with uh, Dragon Ball Z. Um, especially in terms of, like, these standalone movies, or maybe not standalone because they're all connected. But still, it's just like, this is the best I've seen. Again, like, I haven't seen Dragon Ball Super Superhero, which... Why do they call it that? Dragon Ball Super Superhero. I don't know. But anyways, maybe it's good. Maybe it's, I don't know. Like, um, until I see that one, this one, Dragon Ball Super Broly is my favorite. You know, even though, like, I'm not, I wouldn't call, my, call myself a Dragon Ball Z fan at this point. But at the same time, I can't deny how great of a movie Dragon Ball Z fan or not uh, Dragon Ball Super Broly is. It is a really great movie. I have not seen this. Um, as a fan of Dragon Ball Z, I kind of stay away from the films. But obviously, as you can tell from my film selections, I am into like dystopian stuff. So I definitely have an interest in dissension. Do you in the audience, let me know in the comments, do you call him Broly or Brawly? Let, <laughs> let me know in the comments, how do you pronounce the name Broly or Brawly? Is it Chelsea or is it Kelsey? <laughs> is it Chelsea or is it Kelsey? <laughs> so for my third and final pick, I chose a film that I've talked about before and I probably will talk about every time we bring up animated films. And it is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, released in 2023. And the only director that I acknowledge is Kent Powers. And um, this movie, I'm, I'm not going to be long winded about this one. It's just a it's just a great movie. I love that the style of animation here, even starting out with um, Into the Spider-Verse. But I feel like this this one has more of a it's a different spice to this one. Uh, the second the second one has a different spice. It's more I don't know. It has a warmer feeling to it than than the, than um, Into the Spider-Verse. And I, I like this one over Into the Spider-Verse just because. I feel like it didn't have to do as much exposition across the spider verse is just a it just has a, a warmer feeling to it in general even when you get into like the relationship between gwen and and uh miles and 
um, just Miles just coming into his into himself, and like that's what I really like about this film is like the coming of age story because not everybody is gonna be a playboy billionaire or a scientist or you know this this genius, but everybody at some point in their life will be a teenager, and so for the adults, it, like this type of movie is nostalgic and then for children it's 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 kind of like euphoric because you look forward to being a teenager and like having those to go through these different learning curves and like for me as a kid i remember watching movies like d2 the mighty ducks and being like i can't wait till i get older and like so i can have this type of friendship or i could you know i can i can have these type of experiences and so i think for kids nowadays you have the same feeling when you watch um across the spider verse um just in terms of the action um this this film is probably like out of all of them the most captivating because you do have spider-man going against all these different people that are supposed to be also heroes and then you have him flying and jumping all over the place you have um these fight scenes against a villain who is more powerful than him and you kind of have the same thing in akira because um kanida does not have powers and he's fighting um tizo um who who is this like all-powerful being but um you also have like the comedic nature too, um, and across the Spider Verse because th it's this guy who just he just has spots like <laughs> on on a forefront. It's like that's that's all you see is this guy who has spots. It's kind of a, kind of a gimmicky thing, but then when he's able to have these portals and like um, just kind of improve his abilities in in the in the span of a second, it's like that's what makes him scary. And I think. That's something that Marvel needs to kind of like look into also is like because even like in its golden age, I feel like that was the issue is that they didn't have villains that were powerful enough. And if they were, then they became weak within an instance, um, a la Bane and uh, <laughs> in the Dark Knight franchise. So um, I think that this film is one that's going to stand the test of time. I can't say what influence it has like I did with Akira or or Ghost yeah. in the Shell, but I do know that it will have an impact on, if not anything, just the portrayal of black superheroes and like how realistic they can be and how they don't have to have a gimmick or even um, their race being like overly explained. Yeah, um, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, one of the greatest animated films of this generation, but then also one of the greatest action animated films of all time i was pretty open about this at the time that it came out i was just like man like especially again not being so much of an animation person that it took me a really long time to watch this it was just like like you and i had a co-worker that was just like you gotta watch you gotta watch you gotta watch so good i was just like yeah, I'll, I'll get around to it and then i remember just like you know one night like when it came on netflix i was like fine i guess i'll watch it now and i just remember like especially with that twist at the end being like it was definitely like a modern day like empire strikes back type of twist type of reveal like or cliffhanger i should say twist slash cliffhanger and it's something that i'm just really really happy that like this generation has something like this you know animation superhero or not like whatever it's just like you know the fact that kids are going to grow up with this movie and be like oh this is my spider-man it's just like that means a lot like it's not it's just it's like these movies are have really been that good. Like, you know, like like I like the first one, first one. I really like, but I really, really, really like this one. And, you know, like like I said, it took me a while to see it. Like I completely missed this theatrical run. And it's just one of those things where just because the hype and the pressure was so strong that I was just like, it just kind of made me want to just be an act like a contrarian and just like not want to see it but then when i did i had to like you know put my foot in my mouth because i was just like okay i get what the hype was all right just to recap my choices for best animated action films are 2004's the incredibles directed by brad bird 2013's batman the dark knight returns directed, directed by jay oliva and 2018's dragon ball super broly directed by tatsuya nagamai and my top three picks for favorite 
animated action film are Akira, directed by Katsuhiro Otomo, Ghost in the Shell by Momoru Oshii, and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, directed by Kent Powers. I just want to know, like, what are you guys' favorite animated action films and which ones do you feel like will be, like, influential? Like, if there if there are any modern ones, I want to know, like, which ones you feel like will be more influential in terms of feature animation or even feature live action, like modern classics, if you will. Especially if they're obscure titles, like nothing that's based off of, like, a comic or, like, a, you know, DC Marvel comic or a well like iconic anime or something like that it's like a complete completely original action animated film like put us on definitely put us on this has been another episode of insomnia for lunch thank you for making it this far if you have not commented on anything drop an emoji for how we did on the pronunciation of these directors especially if you know the correct pronunciation um or if you'd like to say pronunciation uh, let me know, let us know um, how you feel about the way that we pronounced it. And also, do you call him Broly or Brawly? Again, this has been another episode of Insomnia for Lunch. I am Space God. This genius over here is Anubis. And we'll be right back after these messages. And then also, I would like to say that I've never in my life told you, you got to go see something. So that is not me at all. Like, and the whole purpose of me doing this show is to get out of the this this idea of me hoarding movies. Like before this show, <laughs> before the the we created this, I I literally would watch something and hope nobody ever seen it. Like, and I still deal with that to this day. So I know for a fact I never said you got to go see it. Now I might have said it's a good movie. Yeah, I think that's what it was. My but, is the one for sure that's like, you got to see it. But you were definitely praising it for sure. Yeah, for sure. I just want <laughs> to let that be known and like let people into who I used to be before Insomnia for Lunch and before we celebrated films on this channel. I definitely was a hoarder when it came to classics.